I got a telephone call that in uh, France they have found three or four boxes with about 170 small rolls, 20 meter each, of uh, films from Palestine. Immediately I knew that this is the film that I'm looking for since 1975. I knew that this is something that is very special. The Life of the Jews in Palestine, a documentary shot in 1913, consists of some of the earliest moving images ever recorded in the Holy Land. But just after the onset of World War I, the film vanished, thought to be lost forever. And here we see pilgrims who are coming to Palestine. The film portrays the dream of a Jewish homeland a land of milk and honey. It's a sharp contrast to the persecution facing Jews in Eastern Europe. You see really a kind of innocence, a lost world. This was a moment in time when people had enthusiasm for what they were doing. They believed in what they were doing. The filmmaker, Noah Sokolovsky, is intent on capturing the Zionist dream. But there's a different narrative, less well-known, hovering just at the edge of things. Who's that at the top of the frame? What do you mean, who are the people here? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> In 1913 Ottoman Palestine, Arabs and Jews lived together in relative harmony. How did this place, so diverse and rich in culture, become the site of today's bitter and seemingly intractable struggle? When you see the film, even though it was shot in 1913, it's very hard not to look at it through a modern lens. You can't help but think about what happened after the filmmaker stopped rolling. I think it's worth going back. Was there a turning point a moment in time when choices were made, the points were argued, and things could have been different. By the mid-1800s, half a million Ottoman subjects, over 400,000 Muslims, 60,000 Christians, and 20,000 Jews call this place home. What we call Palestine today, or what became Palestine in the British Mandate, was made up of several Ottoman provinces or administrative units. and the boundaries were as far north as the province of Beirut and south as the Sinai Peninsula, at the core of which was the city of Jerusalem, which was governed directly from Istanbul. The people who later would call themselves Palestinian were always aware of that area as a holy land for Muslims, Jews, and Christians. But the land was almost like a living entity. And this topography was part of the fabric of local memory, local history. And access to land, 
that you can pass on to your children. That's what was measured self-worth. Until the 1880s, half the Jews in Palestine are Sephardic, of Mediterranean origin. In an empire dominated by Islamic culture, they identify as Ottoman, speak Arabic, and like Christians, accept their secondary status. Palestine was under Ottoman control at that time. The place was above all an Ottoman uh, region, and we tend to forget that. Most of the population lived in the mountains, whereas the plains and the lower areas were uh, less populated. Their land was less suitable for traditional uh, agriculture. And these are the regions where most of the Jewish colonization activity took place since the 80s. In 1881, Tsar Alexander of Russia is assassinated. Blamed for the economic turmoil that ensues, a wave of anti-Semitic violence, pogroms, is unleashed on the Ashkenazi, Jews of Eastern Europe. The result of that is massive Jewish emigration from Eastern Europe. About two million Jews pack up, go to the shore, get on boats, and leave between 1882 and 1903. And of those, only two to three percent end up going to Palestine. This wave of immigrants caused the first Aliyah. The majority of people who were leaving Russia at that time were going to America in search of greater economic opportunity. But a very small portion did end up in Palestine. Most of those who are coming to Palestine are still coming for the same reasons Jews had been immigrating to Palestine previously. They come to the Holy Land to study scripture, often to be buried there. Many of them have little to no agricultural background at all, and certainly no knowledge of how to be a farmer in Palestine, which of course is rather different from the Russian Pale of Settlement. The immigrants who are arriving called their settlements Rishon Litzion, first in Zion, or Petach Tikva, Ray of Hope. They gave the names to reflect their sense of hope of going to the Holy Land. During the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire is susceptible to the dominant political force sweeping Europe, the rise of nationalism. The sprawling empire starts to crumble as one ethnic group after another claims its independence. Meanwhile, outdated immigration laws keep the empire from controlling an influx of Eastern European Jews. The Ottomans did what they could to prevent the immigration of Jews to Palestine. The Ottoman Empire was besieged by many minorities in the Balkans and in the Middle East, and the last thing they wanted was yet another group that had national aspirations in Palestine. Many Jews who immigrate to the Ottoman Empire remain subjects, or in some cases citizens, of the countries from which they had come, and this allows them certain benefits based on the fact that they are then subject to the consulates of those countries rather than, in most cases, to Ottoman law. Many of the Jews who came wanted to stay, and then they would sort of disappear into Palestine. And it was impossible to track them or to get them to leave once they had arrived. The first Aliyah nearly triples the number of Jews in Palestine. And from an early settlement called Rehovot comes fresh evidence of the first dispute over land between the new arrivals and their Arab neighbors. 
Rehovot was established by a group of colonists in 1890, some 25 kilometers southeast of Jaffa. And there was a group of Bedouin living there. They cultivated the land, but they were not the owners. And when Rehovot was established, the colonists asked the, um, the Bedouins to leave. And the Bedouins uh, rejected it. They thought that they have rights on the land. They lived there, they cultivated it. Even though they were not its owners, they still believed that they deserved some compensation. In Turkey, a petition has just been discovered. In it, the Bedouins plead their case to the Sultan. After a tense exchange between the Arab Abu Hatiba and the Russian settler Levin Epstein. قبيلتنا فيها 32 عيلة مخلصة للدولة العثمانية دام الله خيرها. هذه القبيلة من أيام قديمة الزمن، أيام أبائنا وأسلافهم اللي اندفنوا فيها، اللي ما عرفوا أرض غيرها. عاشوا فيها وما في عنا مكان غيرها نعيش فيه. Мы так поняли, что после того, как мы купили землю, получили документы от правительства. Мы стали единственными ее владельцами. Мы посадили виноградники и боялись, что они уничтожат их своими стадами. Мы попросили их покинуть нашу землю, но они утверждали, что они ее арендовали. Сару и Турдона бьют о мекан ищетна. У кельма натназал лейхом акцар, кельма аарадона ма муга у машад. Хаду лмазра абал гуа. وصار الأجنبي يرفض معاملتنا حسب المعايير المقبولة بين الفلاحين وحسب معايير الإنسانية والشفقة واستولوا على أرضنا. In Istanbul, incidents like Rehovot are dismissed as insignificant, merely local misunderstandings. But in Europe, a new brand of Jewish identity called Zionism is gaining momentum. In 1896, Theodor Herzl writes Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state, which becomes the manifesto for the Zionist movement. Herzl is a Viennese Jew. For him, the experience of anti-Semitism is the critical definitive moment when he sort of converted to Zionism. But Herzl's diagnosis is that the problem is that Jews are guests everywhere in a world of nation states that are coming into being. The reason for anti-Semitism is that Jews are this strange, homeless nation, and they need to have a home of their own. The following year, Herzl convenes the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. The big question for delegates is where the new Jewish homeland should be. The delegates realize that to set up a Jewish state is going to require a lot of support. They believe there's only one place that you can get the majority of Jews to rally around, and that's Palestine. The last time there was a Jewish kingdom, it was there. From a notable Palestinian family, Yusuf Khalidi is now mayor of Jerusalem. Alarmed by Zionist activity in Europe, in 1899 he reaches out to Herzl in a series of letters. من يستطيع أن يتحدى حقوق اليهود في فلسطين؟ يا إلهي، من الناحية التاريخية هو حق من بلدكم، لكن مصير الأمم لا يحكم بمفاهيم مجردة. بغض النظر عن نقائها ونبلها. Die zionistische Idee, von der ich am bescheidenen Diener bin, hat keine feindlichen Absichten der osmanischen Regierung gegenüber. Wenn Sie die Emigration von einer Anzahl von Juden erlauben, die ihre Intelligenz, ihren finanziellen Scharfsinn und ihre Werte des Unternehmens zum Land holen, 
kann niemand bezweifeln, dass das Wohl des gesamten Landes in glücklicher Weise gestaltet wird. Glauben Sie wirklich, dass ein Araber, der Land oder ein Haus in Wert von 3.000, 4.000 Franken in Palästina besitzt, traurig wird, wenn das Wert fünf- bis zehnfach steigt? In der Despite Khalidi's warning, the Zionists forge ahead. A decade later, their astounding progress would become the focus of Sokolovsky's 1913 film. This was a film that was supported by the Zionist movement. It was trying to show all that had been achieved and all that was possible. He was trying to capture a reality, but it was a selective reality. The film provides all the documentary evidence needed to justify an increasingly popular Zionist slogan, a land without a people for a people without a land. The slogan would have lasting implications. Well, it all depends on where the photographer aims the camera, right? I mean, you have the famous image of shareholders for Achuzat Bayt, which becomes Tel Aviv in 1905, standing on the sand dunes. While the photographer was positioned to their south, photographing them to the north, in which there were, in fact, sand dunes. Had he turned 180 degrees to photograph himself behind them, they would have seen the vast orchard groves of Christian and Muslim landowners. They would have seen Jaffa, an important bustling port city with a very vibrant local, regional, and international economy. What is meant by the slogan, land without a people, is that the Arabs of Palestine do not constitute a national entity. These people somehow are generic Arabs. They belong to the desert. They are rootless. In the minds of those who believed in the slogan, Arabs are part of nature. There's a tree, a rock, a sheep, and a person, but they're indistinguishable from each other. Achad Ha'am, another important leader of spiritual Zionism, says that sometimes the attitude taken by the immigrant settlers is what's called in Hebrew, Eved Kim Loch, a slave who has become king, right? All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're strutting around, you think you're master of the land, and you treat these people poorly. And he said, watch out. The Arab is not a donkey. The Arabs have pride. This could come back to haunt us. Today, the old city of Jerusalem feels timeless, divided into its four distinct quarters. But in 1913, it felt very different. Jerusalem was not as we know it today, first partitioned into Palestinian East and Israeli West, and then Muslim Quarter, Christian Quarter. These names came later on. The physical place was very mixed. At the end of the day, Jews, Christians, and Muslims intermingled, lived together in the various neighborhoods and quarters of the old city. It's not a Garden of Eden. It's a, I would say, more than workable uh, solution. 
the Ottoman Empire does a reasonable job through most of its history of being this multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, multi-religious society. That's not to say there aren't frictions, but by and large, uh, especially in a pre-nationalist age, this works. An important part of Middle Eastern heritage is the coffee house. Those were like the communal places of meeting. It was a place to go spend the entire evening into the late hours of the night. From the coffee house comes a unique record of daily urban life. In the diaries of the Arab Christian musician, Wasif Shohariye. Wasif's music group includes a Muslim, a Christian, and a Jew. His coffee house audience is just as mixed. There's a cultural fluidity enjoyed by all. The Jews who held Ottoman citizenship were able to be integrated, not only with the Arabs living in Palestine, but also to be integrated in the Ottoman political framework. So they were able to hold office, to be mayors, to be elected to the Ottoman parliament, etc., to become much more involved in, the, in Ottoman political life at the time. But the influx of foreign Jews is undermining the delicate cultural balance so carefully nurtured by prominent Ottoman Jews like Albert Antebi. Albert Antebi was born in Damascus. He was a Sephardic Jew. He came from a long line of rabbis. He spoke Arabic and a number of other languages. He knew the Turkish legal system. He knew the Islamic legal system. He felt comfortable in the Ottoman culture. And if you asked him what he was, he probably would have told you I'm an Ottoman. And Tabi actually was concerned about what he considered the malicious cultural impact of European Jews, who happened to be Zionists also, in creating a wedge between the native Jewish community and the Ottoman state. Je serai toujours un fervent soutien de toute société palestinienne qui contribuera au bien-être des Juifs par des moyens économiques. L'installation de colonies juives en Eretz Israël ne sera possible que si elle repose sur une forte collaboration économique et culturelle entre juifs, chrétiens et musulmans. In 1903, a new round of pogroms in Eastern Europe triggers a second Aliyah. This wave of Ashkenazi immigrants is twice as large as the first and is dominated by young Russian activists with a determined socialist agenda. The people of the Second Aliyah were much more engaged with political work and much more aware of the political situation in the country. The Second Aliyah came to Palestine because they wanted to, uh, to build a communal settlement. They were Marxists. They believed in socialism. They take part in the Russian Revolution of 1905. They were completely different from the first Aliyah colonists. The new immigrants are not used to the land, the climate, or the work conditions. They confront their individual shortcomings by forming collective farms. They would divide up the chores. They would share in the raising of children. They pooled their talents, their money, their time, and their labor. And together, they were able to achieve more than they would have been able to do as individual farmers. The collective, which would later become the kibbutz, 
is a key building block of the Zionist movement, championed by leaders like Manya Shokhat. Manya Shokhat is not a Zionist, but because of certain unexpected turns in her life, she ends up in Palestine. Most specifically, in Russia itself, she's arrested for her revolutionary activities and thrown in jail. When she's released, one of her brothers in Palestine invites her for a visit, okay, to get her out of there. And once she's in Palestine, she undergoes a radical transformation and she throws in her lot with the Zionist movement. <laughs> By the time the second Aliyah comes to Palestine, the empire has reached a crisis point. It's fighting multiple wars with neighboring empires while losing one territory after another to internal factions. In desperation, Sultan Abdul Hamid II tightens his grip on the remaining territories. But it's too late. In 1908, intellectuals and army officers joined together to overthrow the Sultan in what becomes known as the Young Turk Revolution. The Young Turks believed that they were going to create a new system of liberty, equality, based very much on the French Revolution and based on the Ottoman identity. Through this idea of patriotism, this is the only way they believed that the Ottoman Empire could survive. They want to keep the Ottoman Empire intact, but they want to allow the different groups under the umbrella of the Ottoman Empire to have more control over their own lives. The revolution instills new hope in many Arabs, including Khalil Sakakini, who had fled the despotism of the Sultan's old regime. Khalil Sakakini is a young Christian Palestinian school teacher. He had emigrated to America, to New York, uh, a few years prior, uh, seeking better fortunes there, hoping to amass enough money to be able to go back and marry his sweetheart, whom he had left behind in, in Jerusalem. And when news arrives in New York about the Ottoman Revolution, we know from his diaries the utter excitement he's overcome with. لقد كنت فرحا ومتفائلا بجدا بالدستور الذي أقرته الإمبراطورية الآن أملك حقا بالعودة إلى وطني عندما تستيقظ الأحلام يبدو كل شيء ممكنا When he went back it was a big comeback for him he built his school he became a newspaper editor he published his books and became extremely prominent. The revolution's euphoria is captured in the diaries of the musician Wasif Jahariye, who is also a student of Sakakini. كانوا يرقصون ويغنون ويهتفون وينشدون الأغاني الوطنية التي كانت تبعث في الروح حتى ساعات الفجر الأولى But the celebrations mask the cracks already forming within Palestine's new Ottoman society 
in Palestine, it becomes very evident that each group, while they're joined together and uniting over the idea of the Young Turk Revolution, they still have very different ideas of what they want from the revolution. Jews welcome the revolution's promise of greater autonomy. But Albert Antebi is alarmed by their reluctance to assume Ottoman identity or citizenship. La Turquie nous a accordé un statut légal. Nous ne pouvons pas les remercier en chassant leurs citoyens pour les remplacer par des Russes. Est-ce que ces Juifs russes font allégeance au drapeau ottoman Non. Ils arborent les rues en brandissant des drapeaux sionistes et en chantant en yiddish ou en russe. Arab complaints about the Jewish activity find a voice in the new constitutional parliament in Istanbul. Jerusalem's elected representative there is Ruhi Khalidi, Yusuf's nephew. لم يبذل اليهود أي جهد من أجل التقارب مع العرب، وإنما فصلوا أنفسهم من خلال اللغة والعيش في مستعمرات مغلقة. كذلك عززوا مخاوف المحليين. اليهود شعب عظيم، ونحن نستطيع أن نستفيد من مدارسهم ومن معارفهم وثرواتهم وخبراتهم، لكن عليهم أن يحصلوا على الجنسية من الدولة العثمانية. Ruhi Khalidi has to spend quite a bit of time in Constantinople, but he does come back to Palestine and makes a point to visit the Jewish settlements. He travels by horseback. He goes from one settlement to the next one. And he writes in his journals that, in many ways, he's impressed. In fact, he's very impressed by how far they've come. He notes even that the wine that they're developing there and growing there is delicious. But one of the things he notices is that he does not have to go far before he is greeted by a guard at the next settlement asking him what his business is. Khalidi begins to discern a larger vision at work. The vision belongs to Arthur Rupin, newly arrived from Germany. Arthur Rupin is a statistician and professor of sociology. He is the point man of the World Zionist Organization in Palestine. He has a much clearer and much more focused vision of the parts of Palestine where settlement should take place. The message of Rupin is the message of practical Zionism. He is actually understanding at that point that uh, in order to achieve the goal, in order to achieve this dream of Jewish state, there must be done certain things which are related to the infrastructure of the settlement, roads, electricity, health, education, and of course, buying land, which is the first thing that he is doing. Landbesitz is the wichtigste Grundvoraussetzung, um sich in Palästina verwurzeln zu können. Wir werden uns nicht über das ganze Land verteilen, sondern wir werden uns auf ein paar wenige gleichförmige Siedlungspunkte konzentrieren. Already during the first Aliyah, you had four, five major blocks of what we call blocks of colonies. And now those blocks basically were combined together to form the famous N shape. Rupin's idea was that whenever possible, settlements should be contiguous plots of land. It would make it easier to defend, but also this would help form the larger infrastructure for a potential state. If you look at the end pattern, it avoids any hill areas. This is because the hill areas were dominated by small landholding peasantry who did not have any incentive or any wish to sell their land, not to anybody. 
In the coastal areas is where we see concentrated ownership in the hands of a few large Palestinian landholders. And these are the people that sold. The life of the Jews in Palestine premieres at the 1913 Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. The film provides Rupin a perfect tool to mobilize worldwide support for the Zionist cause. Manche Menschen denken, dass wir bereits außergewöhnliches für die Entwicklung Palästinas geleistet haben. Unglücklicherweise sieht es für mich nach sehr wenig aus im Vergleich zu dem, was noch vor uns liegt. In Wirklichkeit Rupin understands there is a great need to explain the urgency of the situation. Because the Jews are in a very dangerous situation in Europe and they must take their political future in their own hands. And the Zionist solution is the only solution for the problem of the Jews in the modern times. And though Arabs remain at the margins of the film, Rupin is aware they will soon be playing a much more significant role. Im Moment sind die Araber weder stark noch organisiert genug, um eine echte Gefahr darzustellen. Aber wir durchleben einen kritischen Moment. Wir werden in Zukunft mit einem Feind rechnen müssen, der sehr ernst zu nehmen sein wird. Rupin's plan, known as the conquest of land, would depend largely on Arab landowners outside Palestine. One of the things that Rupin was able to take advantage of is that a large portion of land was owned by absentee landlords who were perfectly happy to sell the land if someone was willing to pay a high price for it. Demand for these lands raised the prices. And that is why the Zionist movement was able to buy from large landowners a great deal of land because they were willing to pay very, very high prices for these lands. This was a period of time in which there was a lot of room to maneuver. There were rules, there were laws, but there was always a way around them. The ability to bribe local Ottoman officials and determination sometimes to find legal or less than legal loopholes and ways to get around uh, lead to a situation in which the Ottomans are simply unable and perhaps not always fully motivated to curb either the immigration or the land sales. The Zionists increasingly turned to Ottoman Jews like Albert Antebi. Antebi was often asked to come and help in various land deals and in cases of mediation needed with the Ottoman authorities and with the local population. He knew everybody, he had, he had ties with everybody. And Tebi is not a Zionist. He wasn't sure what all of their goals were or if he even agreed with them. But he is very much in favor of Jewish economic empowerment. And so I think he always found himself caught in between. Déjà, le peuple parle de se protéger des Juifs. Mais que peut bien nous rapporter de provoquer l'amertume de nos concitoyens Je prédis que nous allons droit vers une situation inextricable d'antisémitisme ottoman si nous ne changeons pas de méthode. One of the things that we'll see happening after the revolution is liberalization of the press. Liberalization of the press will allow for the emergence of an unprecedented number of Arabic language newspapers to appear, which will be voicing all sorts of ideas. And pretty early on, we'll find a number of newspapers deeply concerned about the impact of Zionism in Palestine. In 1908, the journalist Najib Nassar establishes the newspaper Al Carmel which will become an important voice against the perceived Zionist threat. Our 
يبيعون الدولة إلى أعدائها إنهم لا يهتمون بالمال يشترون القرى واحدة تلو الأخرى إيسا آل إيسا an intellectual from Jaffa launches another paper, Philistine, and goes directly after the Arab absentee landowners. إنهم يبيعون إرث آبائهم للتحقيق مكاسب مالية وتستطيع رؤية الغدر في وجوههم يجب معرفة أسماء هؤلاء الخونة لكي يعرف الناس من هم الكذابون ومن هم المستوطنون Amid the growing chorus of Arab protests, Zionists are already taking their next step, the conquest of labor. The Jews in Eastern Europe were craftsmen and peddlers, and in Palestine it would be different. They should be agriculturists, build farms, be a, a new Jew. One of the critiques held that Jews were disconnected from land generally and from their own land uh, in particular, and that a return to the land was fundamental to this. The people of the second Aliyah came to the first Aliyah colonies. They saw that the Jewish farmers were the bosses, overlooking the activity of hundreds of Arab workers, and they rejected it. They rejected this notion of Arab labor and wanted to conquer the land and wanted to be able to do it themselves. Legally, of course, the Zionists could expel the Arabs, but morally, we can see the problem. The socialist pioneers spoke about pure Jewish labor. And when you speak about pure Jewish labor, you make a shift in the conflict. It's not any more local, but national. In Manya Shokat's diary, the subtle but unmistakable shift is evident. And with the displacement of peasant farmers, Arab nationalism begins to emerge, voiced by leaders like Sakakini. Sakakini really raised a kind of political identity and consciousness among young Christian and Muslim Arabs. He would eventually come to represent the kind of opposition that Rupin was warning against. Someone who had a vision, just like the Zionists did, and would be in conflict with the Zionist vision. Meanwhile, the Zionist vision is taking shape. Hospitals, schools, post offices appear. Ruhi Halidi sounds the alarm in the Ottoman parliament. I mean, what Ruhi al Khalidi is trying to say is that this is a threat not only to Palestinians or to the Arabs, local Arabs of the region, but it's also a threat to the Ottoman state. He's never able to sell this idea. The Ottoman parliamentarians, they ask one question, are the Jews paying taxes? And Ruhi al-Khaladi says, yes. So then they answer, then what's the problem?
With Parliament looking the other way, Palestine descends into lawlessness. On the one hand, this allows the Zionists to take advantage and to really push their agenda forward. But on the other hand, it became increasingly important for them to hire guards to protect their growing number of settlements. Early on, these guards are often Arab guards from the local nearby village, right? In fact, sometimes you even get a sort of protection system there, right? Hire me as a guard so I don't come and destroy your vineyard. In other words, guarding is not an indication in these days of national conflict by any means. The establishment of a Shomer indicates the beginning of a shift. HaShomer becomes the first Zionist paramilitary organization. It's comprised solely of Jewish guards. They would come from Russia, frequently didn't speak Arabic, which created some trouble. And they would dress like Bedouins and ride on horseback. They were illiterate people, chauvinists. They spoke Yiddish and not Hebrew. Even a poor Yiddish, they curse a lot. They were people that I, I wouldn't like to meet in Sejera in uh, midnight. Some people see them as exacerbating conflict rather than alleviating it. The slogan of Ashomer was, in blood and fire, Judea fell, and blood and fire, Judea will arise again. By 1913, such provocations have raised tensions to a dangerous new level. C'est en vain que nous avertissons les sionistes du danger de cette intolérance sectaire. En vain que nous les avertissons des conséquences désastreuses de leurs actions anti-chrétiennes, anti-musulmanes et xénophobes. إذا كنت أكره الحركة الصهيونية فهو لأنها تحاول أن تبني كيانها المستقل على حساب دولة أخرى. احتلال فلسطين هو مثل احتلال قلب الأمة العربية. The Arab press grows openly contemptuous. نحن أمة مهددة أمام المد الصهيوني على هذه الأراضي الفلسطينية. اتركوا رجالنا لكي يبدأوا جيوب المستوطنين الذين سيقاتلون على وجودنا. إلى متى ستظل الطفيليات تتغذى على جسد الوطن؟ إذا فقدنا الوطن فما فائدة للحياة؟ In Rupin's Palestine office. Journalists like Nassam Malul read the Arab press, fearful of worsening relations. I wanted to Even Rupin wonders if the Zionists have gone too far. Das Los wird entscheiden, wenn es um die zukünftige Geschichtsschreibung gehen wird. Werden die zionistischen Aspirationen als Beginn von einer wichtigen Bewegung gesehen oder als wahnwitzige Fantastereien? Wird man eines Tages über mich sagen, ich hätte ein hohes Amt zu einem historisch wichtigen Moment inne gehabt und versagt, zu verstehen, was von mir erwartet wurde? It began, reports agree, as a simple brawl over the theft of a bunch of grapes. Within days, it would mark a turning point in the history of Arabs and Jews. According to the Zionist report, Arab camel drivers from a neighboring village are bringing goods to Rehovot, 
site of the land disagreement years earlier. On the way, they enter a vineyard and steal some grapes. A Hashomer guard gives chase and brutally beats an Arab. In the process, he's robbed of his weapon. Within hours, more Hashomer from Rehovot appear on the scene. They confront the camel driver. Then, reinforcements arrive from the Arab village. The scuffle becomes a shootout. A horse is shot, and a camel. One Hashomer and one Arab are killed. a milestone in the Jewish-Arab conflict. Even though it was a local incident, it led to such an uproar. You can see villagers from all over the region coming together to sign the petition against the Jewish activity. Hashomer, when they were asked by the colonists, why did you beat the thief so brutally? The guard said, because he stole a grape, not from the colony, but from the Jewish people. Up until that moment, there was a sense that there is this kind of us. We're Ottomans, Muslims, Jews, Christians. We share a common history. And what emerges from Rehovot is a fracturing of the Ottomans and a greater sense of this is becoming an us versus them conflict between Jews and Arabs. In Rehovot's wake, the growing conflict can no longer be ignored. Both sides seek a peaceful solution and talks begin. Then in 1914, World War I intervenes. As the world is engulfed in war, any hope for resolution quickly fades. Instead, events in Rehovot would foreshadow a century of mistrust, enmity, and violence. History is something that you can't control. If the war hadn't broken out, could things have gone in a different direction? We'll never know. But I think it's important to remember that there was a moment when different groups shared a city, shared a land, and for a moment in time, shared history. Today, Sokolovsky's film provides insight into how things first went wrong. In an opening scene, immigrants brim with optimism as they head toward the promised land. They sail past Istanbul, seat of the Ottoman Empire. And for a moment, the camera pans to an Allied warship in the harbor. It's 1913. World War I is looming on the horizon. As is the conflict 
whose seeds have just been sown.